Chapter Sixteen of the Skylark of Space by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Osmonian Marriage. Seaton awoke hot and uncomfortable, but with a great surge of joy in his heart. This was his wedding day. Springing from the bed, he released the full stream of the cold water, filling the tank in a few moments. Poising lightly upon the edge, he made a clean, sharp dive, and yelled in surprise as he came snorting to the surface. For Dunark had made good his promise. The water was only a few degrees above the freezing point. After a few minutes of vigorous splashing in the icy water, he rubbed himself down with a coarse towel, shaved, threw on his clothes, and lifted his powerful but musical bass voice in the wedding chorus from The Rose Maiden. Rise, sweet maid, arise, arise. Rise, sweet maid, arise, arise. Tis the last fair morning for thy maiden eyes. He sang lustily, out of his sheer joy in being alive, and was surprised to hear Dorothy's clear soprano, Margaret's pleasing contralto, and Crane's mellow tenor chime in from the adjoining rooms. Crane threw open the door, and Seaton joined the others. "'Good morning, Dick. You sound happy,' said Crane. "'Who wouldn't be? Look what's doing today,' as he ardently embraced his bride-to-be. "'Besides, I found some cold water this morning.' "'Everyone in the palace heard you discovering it,' dryly returned Crane, and the girls laughed merrily. "'It surprised me at first, admitted Seaton. "'But it's great after a fellow once gets wet.' We warmed ours a trifle, said Dorothy. I like a cold bath myself, but not in ice water. All four became silent, thinking of the coming event of the day, until Crane said, They have ministers here, I know, and I know something of their religion, but my knowledge is rather vague. You know more about it than we do, Dick. Suppose you tell us about it while we wait. Seaton paused a moment with an odd look on his face as one turning the pages of an unfamiliar book of reference. He was seeking the answer to Crane's question in the vast store of Osnomian information received from Dunark. His usually ready speech came a little slowly. Well, as nearly as I can explain it, it's a funny kind of mixture, partly theology, partly Darwinianism, or at least making a fetish of evolution and partly pure economic determinism. They believe in a supreme being, whom they call the first cause. That is the nearest English equivalent, and they recognize the existence of an immortal and unknowable life principle, or soul. They believe that the first cause has decreed the survival of the fittest as the fundamental law, which belief accounts for their perfect physiques. Perfect physiques? Why, they are as weak as children, interrupted Dorothy. Yes, but that is because of the smallness of the planet, returned Seaton. You see, a man of my size weighs only eighty-six pounds here, on a spring balance, so he would need only the muscular development of a boy of twelve or so. In a contest of strength, either of you girls could easily handle two of the strongest men upon Osnome. In fact, the average Osnomian could stand up on our earth only with the greatest difficulty. But that isn't the fault of the people. They are magnificently developed for their surroundings. They have attained this condition by centuries of weeding out the unfit. They have no hospitals for the feeble-minded or feeble-bodied. Abnormal persons are not allowed to live. The same reasoning accounts for their perfect cleanliness, moral and physical. Vice is practically unknown. They believe that clean living and clean thinking are rewarded by the production of a better physical and mental type. Yes, especially as they correct wrong living by those terrible punishments the Codifex told us about, interrupted Margaret. That probably helps some. They also believe that the higher the type is, the faster will evolution proceed, and the sooner will mankind reach what they call the ultimate goal and know all things. Believing as they do that the fittest must survive, 
and thinking themselves, of course, the superior type, it is ordained that Mardonail must be destroyed utterly, root and branch. They believe that the slaves are so low in the scale, millions of years behind in evolution, that they do not count. Slaves are simply intelligent and docile animals, little more than horses or oxen. Mardanalians and savages are unfit to survive and must be exterminated. Their ministers are chosen from the very fittest. They are the strongest, cleanest living, and most vigorous men of this clean and vigorous nation, and are usually high army officers as well as ministers. An attendant announced the coming of the Carfidix and his son to pay the call of state. After the ceremonious greetings had been exchanged, all went into the dining hall for Darprat. As soon as the meal was over, Seaton brought up the question of the double wedding that Cocam, and the Carfidix was overjoyed. Carfidix Seaton, he said earnestly, nothing could please us more than to have such a ceremony performed in our palace. Marriage between such highly evolved persons as are you four is wished by the first cause, whose servants we are. Aside from that, it is an unheard of honor for any ruler to have even one Carfidex married beneath his roof, and you are granting me the privilege of two. I thank you, and assure you that we will do our poor best to make the occasion memorable. Don't do anything fancy, said Seaton hastily. A simple, plain wedding will do. Unheeding Seaton's remark, the Carfidex took his wireless from its hook at his belt and sent a brief message. I have summoned the Carbix Tarnan to perform the ceremony. Our usual time for ceremonies is just before Colprat. Is that time satisfactory to you? Assured that it was, he turned to his son. Dunark, you are more familiar than I with the customs of our illustrious visitors. May I ask you to take charge of the details? While Dunark sent a rapid succession of messages, Dorothy whispered to Seaton, They must be going to make a real function of our double wedding, Dick. The Carbix is the highest dignitary of the church, isn't he? Yes, in addition to being the commander-in-chief of all Condolean armies. Next to the Carfidex, he is the most powerful man in the Empire. Something tells me, Dottie, that this is going to be some ceremony. As Dunark finished telegraphing, Seaton turned to him. Dorothy said a while ago that she would like to have enough of that tapestry fabric for a dress. Do you suppose it could be managed? Certainly. In all state ceremonies, we always wear robes made out of the same fabric as the tapestries but much finer and more delicate. I would have suggested it, but thought perhaps the ladies would prefer their usual clothing. I know that you two men do not care to wear our robes. We will wear white ducks, the dressiest and coolest things we have along, replied Seaton. Thank you for your offer, but you know how it is. We should feel out of place in such gorgeous dress. I understand. I will call on a few of our most expert robe-makers, who will weave the gowns. Before they come, let us decide upon the ceremony. I think you are familiar with our marriage customs, but I will explain them to make sure. Each couple is married twice. The first marriage is symbolized by the exchange of plain bracelets and lasts for carcamo, during which period divorce may be obtained at will. The children of such divorced couples formerly became wards of the state, but in my lifetime I have not heard of there being any such children. All divorces are now between couples who discover their incompatibility before children are conceived. That surprises me greatly, said Crane. Some system of trial marriage is advocated among us on earth every few years but they all so surely degenerate into free love that no such system has found a foothold. We are not troubled in that way at all. You see, before the first marriage, each couple, from the humblest peasantry to the highest royalty, must submit to a mental examination. If they are marrying for any reason at all other than love, 
such as any thought of trifling in the mind of the man, or if the woman is marrying him for his wealth or position, he or she is summarily executed, regardless of station. No other questions being asked, Dunark continued. At the end of four Carcamo, the second marriage is performed, which is indissoluble. In this ceremony, jeweled bracelets are substituted for the plain ones. In the case of highly evolved persons, it is permitted that the two ceremonies be combined into one. Then there is a third ceremony, used only in the marriage of persons of the very highest evolution, in which the eternal vows are taken, and the faden, the eternal jewel, is exchanged. As you are all in the permitted class, you may use the eternal ceremony if you wish. I think we all know our minds well enough to know that we want to be married for good, the longer the better, said Seaton positively. We will make it the eternal, won't we, folks? I should like to ask one question, said Crane thoughtfully. Does the ceremony imply that my wife would be breaking her vows if she married again upon my death? Far from it. Numbers of our men are killed every carcam. Their wives, if of marriageable age, are expected to marry again. Then, too, you know that most Condolian men have several wives. No matter how many wives or husbands may be linked together in that way, it merely means that after death their spirits will be grouped into one, just as in your chemistry, smiling in comradely fashion at Seton, a varying number of elements may unite to form a stable compound. After a short pause, the speaker went on. Since you are from Earth and unaccustomed to bracelets, rings will be substituted for them. The plain ring will take the place of your earthly wedding rings, the jeweled ones that of your engagement rings. The only difference is that while we discard the plain bracelets, you will continue to wear them. Have you men any objection to wearing the rings during the ceremony? You may discard them later, if you wish, and still keep the marriage valid. No, I'll wear mine all my life, responded Seaton earnestly, and Crane expressed the same thought. There is only one more thing, added the Kofidix, that is, about the mental examination. Since it is not your custom, it is probable that the justices would waive the ruling especially since everyone must be examined by a jury of his own or a superior rank, so that only one man, my father alone, could examine you. Not in a thousand years, replied Seaton emphatically. I want to be examined and have Dorothy see the record. I don't care about having her put through it, but I want her to know exactly what kind of guy she is getting. Dorothy protested at this, but as all four were eager that they themselves should be tested, the Carfidix was notified, and Dunark clamped sets of multiple electrodes connected to a set of instruments upon the temples of his father, Dorothy, and Seaton. He pressed a lever, and instantly Dorothy and Seaton read each other's minds to the minutest detail, and each knew that the Carfidix was reading the minds of both. After Margaret and Crane had been examined, the Carfidix expressed himself as more than satisfied. You are all of the highest evolution, and your minds are all untainted by any base thoughts in your marriage. The first cause will smile upon your unions, he said solemnly. Let the robe makers appear, the Carfidex ordered, and four women, hung with spools of brilliantly colored wire of incredible fineness, and, with peculiar looms under their arms, entered the room and accompanied the two girls to their apartment. As soon as the room was empty, save for the four men, Dunark said, While I was in Mardenale, I heard bits of conversation regarding an immense military discovery possessed by Nalboon, besides the gas whose deadly effects we felt. I could get no inkling of its nature, but feel sure that it is something to be dreaded. I also heard that both of these secrets had been stolen from Condal, and that we were to be destroyed by our own superior inventions. 
The Carfedix nodded his head gloomily. That is true, my son, partly true at least. We shall not be destroyed, however. Condal shall triumph. The discoveries were made by a Condalian, but I am as ignorant as you are concerning their nature. An obscure inventor, living close to the bordering ocean, was the discoverer. He was rash enough to wireless me concerning them. He would not reveal their nature, but requested a guard. The Mardonalian patrol intercepted the message and captured both him and his discoveries before our guard could arrive. That's easily fixed, suggested Seaton. Let's get the Skylark fixed up, and we'll jerk Nal Boone out of his palace, if he's still alive. Bring him over here and read his mind. That might prove feasible, answered the Kofedex, and in any event, we must repair the Skylark and replenish her supply of copper immediately. This must be our first consideration, so that you, our guests, will have a protection in any emergency. The Carfedex went to his duties, and the other three made their way to the wrecked space car. They found that besides the damage done to the hull, many of the instruments were broken, including one of the object compasses focused upon the Earth. It's a good thing you had three of them, Mart. I sure hand it to you for preparedness, said Seaton, as he tossed the broken instrument out upon the dock. Dunark protested at this treatment and placed the discarded instrument in a strong metal safe, remarking, These things may prove useful at some future time. Well, I suppose the first thing to do is get some powerful jacks and straighten these plates, said Seaton. Why not throw away the soft metal, steel, and build it out of arnak, as it should be built? You have plenty of salt, suggested Dunark. Fine, we have lots of salt in the galley, haven't we, Mart? Yes, nearly a hundred pounds. We are stocked for emergencies, with two years' supply of food, you know. Dunark's eyes opened in astonishment at the amount mentioned, in spite of his knowledge of earthly conditions. He started to say something, then stopped in confusion. But Seaton divined his thought. We can spare him fifty pounds as well as not, can't we, Mart? Certainly, fifty pounds of salt is a ridiculously cheap price for what he is doing for us, even though it is very rare here. Dunark acknowledged the gift with shining eyes and a heartfelt but not profuse thanks, and bore the precious bag to the palace under a heavy escort. He returned with a small army of workmen, and after making tests to assure himself that the power bar would work as well through arnak as through steel, he instructed the officers concerning the work to be done. As the wonderfully skilled mechanics set to work without a single useless motion, the prince stood silent, with a look of care upon his handsome face. Worrying about Mardinale, Dunark? Yes, I cannot help wondering what that terrible new engine of destruction is, which Nalboon now has at his command. Say, why don't you build a bus like the Skylark and blow Mardendale off the map? Building the vessel would be easy enough, but X is as yet unknown upon Osnome. We've got a lot of it. I could not accept it. The salt was different, since you have plenty. X, however, is as scarce upon Earth as salt is upon Osnome. Sure you can accept it. We stopped at a planet that has lots of it, and we've got an object compass pointing at it so that we can go back and get more of it any time we want it. We've got more of it on hand now than we're apt to need for a long time. So have a hunk and get busy. And he easily carried one of the lumps out of his cabin and tossed it upon the dock, from whence it required two of Condal's strongest men to lift it. The look of care vanished from the face of the prince, and he summoned another corps of mechanics. How thick shall the walls be? Our battleships are armed with arnak, the thickness of a hand. But with your vast supply of salt, you may have it any thickness you wish, since the materials of the matrix are cheap and abundant. One inch would be enough, but everything in the bus is designed for a four-foot shell and if we change it from four feet 
we'll have to redesign our guns and all our instruments. Let's make it four feet. Seaton turned to the crippled Skylark, upon which the first crew of Condolian mechanics were working with skill and with tools undreamed of upon Earth. The whole interior of the vessel was supported by a complex falsework of latticed metal. Then the four-foot steel plates and the mighty embers, the pride of the great MacDougall, were cut away as though they were made of paper by revolving saws and enormous power shears. The sphere, grooved for the repellers, and with the members, braces, and central machinery complete, of the exact dimensions of the original, was rapidly molded of a stiff plastic substance resembling clay. This matrix soon hardened into a rock-like mass into which the doors, machine gun emplacements, and other openings were carefully cut. All surfaces were then washed with a dilute solution of salt, which the workmen handled as though it were radium. Two great plates of platinum were clamped into place upon either side of the vessel, each plate connected by means of silver cables as large as a man's leg to the receiving terminals of an enormous wireless power station. The current was applied, and the great spherical mass apparently disappeared, being transformed instantly into the transparent metal arnak. Then, indeed, had the earthmen a vehicle such had never been seen before, a four-foot shell of metal five hundred times as strong and hard as the strongest and hardest steel, cast in one piece, with the sustaining framework designed by the world's foremost engineer, a structure that no conceivable force could deform or injure, housing an inconceivable propulsive force. The false work was rapidly removed, and the sustaining framework was painted with opaque varnish to render it plainly visible. At Seaton's suggestion, the walls of the cabins were also painted, leaving transparent several small areas to serve as windows. The second work period was drawing to a close, and as Seaton and Crane were to be married before Culprat, they stopped work. They marveled at the amount that had been accomplished, and the Kofidix told them, Both vessels will be finished tomorrow, except for the controlling instruments, which we will have to make ourselves. Another crew will work during the sleeping period, installing the guns and other fittings. Do you wish to have your own guns installed, or guns of our pattern? You are familiar with them now. Our own, please. They are slower and less efficient than yours. But we are used to them, and have a lot of explosive ammunition for them, replied Seaton, after a short conference with Crane. After instructing the officers in charge of the work, the three returned to the palace, the hearts of two of them beating in high anticipation. Seaton went into Crane's room, accompanied by two attendants bearing his suitcase and other luggage. We should have brought along dress clothes, Mart. Why didn't you think of that, too? Nothing like this ever entered my mind. It's a good thing we brought along ducks and white soft shirts. I must say that this is extremely informal garb for a state wedding, but since the natives are ignorant of our customs, it will not make any difference. That's right, too. We'll make them think it's the most formal kind of dress. Dunark knows what's what, but he knows that full dress would be unbearable here. We'd melt down in a minute. It's plenty hot enough as it is, with only duck trousers and sport shirts on. They'll look green instead of white, but that's a small matter. Dunark, as best man, entered the room some time later. Give us a look, Dunark, begged Seaton, and see if we'll pass inspection. I was never so rattled in my life. They were clad in spotless white, from their duck oxfords, to the white ties encircling the open collars of their tennis shirts. The two tall figures, Crane's slender, wiry at perfect ease, Seaton's broad-shouldered, powerful, prowling about with unconscious feline suppleness and grace, and the two handsome, high-bred, 
intellectual faces, each wearing a look of eager happiness, fully justified Dunark's answer. "'You sure will do,' he pronounced enthusiastically, and with Seaton's own impulsive goodwill, he shook hands and wished them an eternity of happiness. "'When you have spoken with your brides,' he continued, "'I shall be waiting to escort you into the chapel. Sitar told me to say that the ladies are ready.' Dorothy and Margaret had been dressed in their bridal gowns by Sitar and several other princesses, under the watchful eye of the Kerfadir herself. Sitar placed the two girls side by side and drew off to survey her work. "'You are the loveliest creatures in the whole world,' she cried. They looked at each other's glittering gowns. Then Margaret glanced at Dorothy's face, and a look of dismay overspread her own. Oh, Dotty, she gasped, your lovely complexion. Isn't it terrible for the boys to see us in this light? There was a peal of delighted laughter from Sitar as she spoke to one of the servants who drew dark curtains across the windows and pressed a switch, flooding the room with brilliant white light. Dunark installed lamps like those of your ship for you, she explained with intense satisfaction. I knew in advance just how you would feel about your color. Before the girls had time to thank their thoughtful hostess, she disappeared, and their bridegrooms stood before them. For a moment, no word was spoken. Seaton stared at Dorothy hungrily, almost doubting the evidence of his senses. For white was white, pink was pink, and her hair shone in all its natural splendor of burnished bronze. In their wondrous Osnomian bridal robes, the beautiful earth maidens stood before their lovers. Upon their feet were jeweled slippers. Their lovely bodies were clothed in softly shimmering garments that left their rounded arms and throats bare, garments infinitely more supple than the finest silk, thick woven of metallic threads of such fineness that the individual wires were visible only under a lens garments that floated and clung about their perfect forms in lines of exquisite grace. For black-haired Margaret, with her ivory skin, the Condolian princess had chosen a background of a rare white metal, upon which, in complicated figures, glistened numberless jewels of pale colors more brilliant than diamonds. Dorothy's dress was of a peculiar dark green shade, half-hidden by an intricate design of blazing green gems, the strange, luminous jewels of this strange world. Both girls wore their long, heavy hair unbound after the Condolean bridal fashion, brushed until it fell like mist about them, and confined at the temples by metallic bands entirely covered with jewels. Seaton looked from Dorothy to Margaret and back again, looked down into her violet eyes, deep with wonder, and with love, more beautiful than any jewel in all her gorgeous costume. Unheeding the presence of the others, she put her dainty hands upon his mighty shoulders and stood on tiptoe. I love you, Dick, now and always, here or at home, or anywhere in the universe. We'll never be parted again, she whispered, and her own beloved violin had no sweeter tones than had her voice. A few minutes later, her eyes wet and shining, she drew herself away from him and glanced at Margaret. Isn't she the most beautiful thing you ever laid eyes on? No, Seaton answered promptly. She is not. But poor old Mart thinks she is. Accompanied by the Carfedix and his son, Seaton and Crane went into the chapel, which, already brilliant, had been decorated anew with even greater splendor. Glancing through the wide arches, they saw for the first time Osnomians clothed. The great room was filled with the highest nobility of Kondal, wearing their heavily jeweled, resplendent robes of state. Every color of the rainbow and numberless fantastic patterns were there, embodied in the soft, lustrous, metallic fabric. As the men entered one door, Dorothy and Margaret, with the Carfadere, and Sitar entered the other, and the entire assemblage rose to its feet and snapped into the grand salute. Moving to the accompaniment 
of strange martial music from concealed instruments, the two parties approached each other, meeting at the raised platform or pulpit where Carbix Tarnan, a handsome, stately, middle-aged man who carried easily his hundred and fifty carcarmo of age, awaited them. As he raised his arms, the music ceased. It was a solemn and wonderfully impressive spectacle. The room of burnished metal, with its bizarre decorations wrought in scintillating gems, the constantly changing harmony of colors as the invisible lamps were shifted from one shade to another, the group of mighty nobles standing rigidly at attention in a silence so profound that it was an utter absence of everything audible, as the Carbix lifted both arms in a silent invocation of the great first cause. All these things deepened the solemnity of that solemn moment. When Tarnan spoke, his voice deep with some great feeling, inexplicable even to those who knew him best, carried clearly to every part of the great chamber. Friends, it is our privilege to assist today in a most notable event, the marriage of four personages from another world. For the first time in the history of Osnome, one Carfedix has the privilege of entertaining the bridal party of another. It is not for this fact alone, however, that this occasion is to be memorable. A far deeper reason is that we are witnessing, possibly for the first time in the history of the universe, the meeting upon terms of mutual fellowship and understanding of the inhabitants of two worlds, separated by unthinkable distances of trackless space and by equally great differences in evolution, condition of life, and environment. Yet these strangers are actuated by the spirit of good faith and honor which is instilled into every worthy being by the great first cause. In the working out of vast projects, all things are humble instruments. In the honor of the friendship of the two worlds, we will proceed with the ceremony. Richard Seaton and Martin Crane exchange the plain rings with Dorothy Veneman and Margaret Spencer. They did so, and repeated, after the Carbix, simple vows of love and loyalty. May the first cause smile upon this temporary marriage and render it worthy of being made permanent. As a lowly servant of the all-powerful first cause, I pronounce you two and you two husband and wife. But we must remember that the dull vision of mortal men cannot pierce the veil of futurity which is as crystal to the all-beholding eye of the first cause. Though you love each other truly, unforeseen things may come between you to mar the perfection of your happiness. Therefore, a time is granted you during which you may discover whether or not your unions are perfect. A pause ensued. Then Tarnan went on. Martin Crane, Margaret Spencer, Richard Seaton, and Dorothy Veneman, you are before us to take the final vows, which shall bind your bodies together for life and your spirits together for eternity. Have you considered the gravity of this step sufficiently to enter into this marriage without reservation? I have, solemnly replied the four in unison. Exchange the jeweled rings. Do you, Richard Seaton and Dorothy Veneman, and you, Martin Crane, and Margaret Spencer, individually swear, here in the presence of the First Cause and that of the Supreme Justices of Condal, that you will be true and loyal, each helping his chosen one in all things, great and small, that never throughout eternity, in thought or in action, will either your body or your mind or your conscious spirit stray from the path of fairness and truth and honor. I do. I pronounce you married with the eternal marriage, just as the phaeton which you each now wear, the eternal jewel which no force of man, however applied, has yet been able to change or deform in any particular, and which continues to give off its inward light without change throughout eternity, shall endure through endless cycles of time after the metal of the ring which holds it shall have crumbled in decay. Even so, 
Shall your spirits, formerly two, now one and indissoluble, progress in ever-ascending evolution throughout eternity, after the base material, which is your bodies, shall have returned to the senseless dust from whence it arose? The Carbicks lowered his arms, and the bridal party walked to the door through a double rank of uplifted weapons. From the chapel they were led to another room, where the contracting parties signed their names in a register. The Kofidix then brought forward two marriage certificates, heavy square plates of brilliant purple metal, beautifully engraved in parallel columns of English and Condolean script, and heavily bordered with precious stones. The principals and witnesses signed below each column, the signatures being deeply engraved by the royal engraver. Leaving the registry, they were escorted to the dining hall, where a truly royal repast was served. Between courses, the highest nobles of the nation welcomed the visitors and wished them happiness in short but earnest addresses. After the last course had been disposed of, the Carbix rose at a sign from the Carfidix and spoke, his voice again agitated by the emotion which had puzzled his hearers during the marriage service. All Condal is here with us in spirit, trying to aid us in our poor attempts to convey our welcome to these our guests, of whose friendship no greater warrant could be given than their willingness to grant us the privilege of their marriage. Not only have they given us a boon that will make their names revered throughout the nation as long as Condell shall exist, but they have also been the means of showing us plainly that the first cause is upon our side, that our age-old institution of honor is, in truth, the only foundation upon which can be built a race fitted to survive. At the same time, they have been the means of showing us that our hated foe, entirely without honor, building his race upon a foundation of bloodthirsty savagery alone, is building wrongly, and must perish utterly from the face of Osnom. His hearers listened, impressed by his earnestness, but plainly not understanding his meaning. You do not understand, he went on, with a deep light shining in his eyes. It is inevitable that two people inhabiting worlds so widely separated as our two should be possessed of widely varying knowledge and abilities, and these strangers have already made it possible for us to construct engines of destruction which shall obliterate Mardanael completely. A fierce shout of joy interrupted the speaker and the nobles sprang to their feet, saluting the visitors with upraised weapons. As soon as they had reseated themselves, the Carbex continued. That is the boon. The vindication of our system of evolution is easily explained. The strangers landed first upon Mardanael. Had now Boone met them in honor, he would have gained the boon. But he, with the savagery and characteristic of his evolution, attempted to kill his guests and steal their treasures. With what results, you already know. We, on our part, in exchange for the few and trifling services we have been able to render them, have received even more than now Boone would have obtained had his plans not been nullified by their vastly superior state of evolution. The orator seated himself, and there was a deafening clamor of cheering as the nobles formed themselves into an escort of honor and conducted the two couples to their apartments. Alone in their room, Dorothy turned to her husband with tears shining in her beautiful eyes. Dick, sweetheart, wasn't that the most wonderful thing that anybody ever heard of? Using the word in all its real meaning, it was indescribably grand, and that old man is simply superb. It makes me ashamed of myself to think that I was ever afraid or nervous here. It sure was all of that, Dotty mine, little bride of an hour. The whole thing gets right down to where a fellow lives. I've got a lump in my throat right now, so big that it hurts me to think. Earthly marriages are piffling in comparison with that ceremony. It's no wonder they're happy after taking those vows, especially as they don't have to take them until after they are sure of themselves. 
But we're sure ready, sweetheart, as he embraced her with all the feeling of his nature. Those vows are not a bit stronger than the ones we have already exchanged. Bodily and mentally and spiritually, we are one, now and forever. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of the Skylark of Space by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bird, beast, or fish? These jewels rather puzzle me, Dick. What are they? asked Martin, as the four assembled waiting for the first meal. As he spoke, he held up his third finger, on which gleamed the royal jewel of Osnome, in its splendid belcher mounting of arnak as transparent as the jewel itself and having the same intense blue color i know the name phaedon but that's all i seem to know that's about all that anybody knows about them it's a naturally occurring hundred faceted crystal just as you see it there deep blue perfectly transparent intensely refractive and constantly emitting that strong blue light. It is so hard that it cannot be worked, cut, or ground. No amount of the hardest known abrasive will even roughen its surface. No blow, however great, will break it. It merely forces its way into the material of the hammer, however hard the hammer may be. No extremity of either heat or cold affects it in any degree. It is the same when in the most powerful electric arc as it is when immersed in liquid helium. How about acids? That is what I'm asking myself. Osmonians aren't much force at chemistry. I'm going to try and get a hold of another one, and see if I can't analyze it, just for fun. I can't seem to convince myself that a real atomic structure could be that large. No, it is rather large for an atom, and turning to the two girls... How do you like your solitaires? They are perfectly beautiful, and the Tiffany mounting is exquisite, replied Dorothy enthusiastically, but they're so awfully big. They're as big as ten-carat diamonds, I do believe. Just about, replied Seaton, but at that they're the smallest Dunark could find. They have been kicking around for years, he says, so small nobody wanted them. They wear big ones on their bracelets, you know. You sure will make a hit in Washington, Dottie. People will think you're wearing a bottle stopper until they see it shining in the dark, and then they'll think it's an automobile headlight. But after a few jewelers have seen these stones, one of them will be offering us five million dollars apiece for them, trying to buy them for some dizzy old dame who wants to put out the eyes of some of her social rivals. Yes? No? That's about right, Dick, replied Crane and his face wore a thoughtful look. We can't keep it secret that we have a new jewel, since all four of us will be wearing them continuously, and anyone who knows jewels at all will recognize these as infinitely superior to any known earthly jewel. In fact, they may get some of us into trouble, as fabulously valuable jewels usually do. That's true, too. So we'll let it out casually, that they're as common as mud up here, that we're just wearing them for sentiment, which is true, and that we're thinking of bringing back a shipload to sell for parking lights. That would probably keep anyone from trying to murder our wives for their rings, at least. Have you read our marriage certificate, Dick? asked Margaret. Not yet. Let's look at it, Dottie. She produced the massive, heavily jeweled document and the auburn head and brown one were very close to each other as they read together the English side of the certificate. Their vows were there, word for word, with their own signatures beneath them, all deeply engraved into the metal. Seaton smiled as he saw the legal form engraved below their signatures and read aloud, I, head of the church and commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Kondal, upon the planet Osnome, Certify that I have this day, in the city of Kondalek, 
of said nation and planet joined in indissoluble bonds of matrimony Richard Ballinger Seaton, Doctor of Philosophy, and Dorothy Lee Vaneman, Doctor of Music, both of the City of Washington, District of Columbia, United States of America, upon the planet Earth, in strict compliance with the marriage laws, both of Condal and of the United States of America. Tarnan. Witness. Roban, Emperor of Condal. Turol, Empress of Condal. Dunark, Crown Prince of Condal. Sitar, Crown Princes of Condal. Mark C. Duquesne, Ph.D., Washington, D.C. That is some document, remarked Seaton. Probably a lawyer could find fault with its phraseology, but I'll bet that this thing would hold in any court in the world. Think you'll get married again when we get back, Mart? Both girls protested, and Crane answered, No, I think not. Our ceremony would be rather an anticlimax after this one, and this one will undoubtedly prove legal. I intend to register this just as it is and get a ruling from the courts. But it is time for breakfast. Pardon me. I should have said Darprat, for it certainly is not breakfast time by Washington clocks. My watch says that it is 11.30 p.m. This system of time is funny, remarked Dorothy, I just can't get used to having no night and... And it's such a long time between eats, as the famous governor said about the drinks, broke in Seaton. How did you know what I was going to say, Dick? Husbandly intuition, he grinned, and aided and abetted by a normal appetite that rebels at seventeen hours between supper and breakfast and nine hours between the other meals. Well, it's time to eat. Let's go. After eating, the men hurried to the Skylark. During the sleeping period, the vessel had been banded with the copper repellers. The machine guns and instruments, including the wonderful Osnomium wireless system, had been installed, and except for the power bars, she was ready for a voyage. The Condolean vessel was complete, even to the cushions, but was without instruments. After a brief conversation with the officer in charge, Dunark turned to Seaton. Didn't you find that your springs couldn't stand up under the acceleration? Yes, they flattened out dead. The Colonex felon in charge of the work thought so and substituted our compound compensated type, made of real spring metal for them. They'll hold you through any acceleration you can live through. Thanks, that's fine. What's next? Instruments? Yes, I have sent a crew of men to gather up what copper they can find. You know that we use practically no metallic copper, as platinum, gold, and silver are so much better for ordinary purposes. And another, to erect a copper smelter near one of the mines which supply the city with copper sulfate used upon our tables. While they are at work, I think I will work on the instruments, if you two will be kind enough to help me. Seaton and Crane offered to supply him with instruments from their reserve stock, but the Kofedex refused to accept them, saying that he would rather have their help in making them so that he would thoroughly understand their functions. The electric furnaces were rapidly made ready, and they set to work, Crane taking great delight in working that hitherto rare and very refractory metal, iridium, of which all the Condolean instruments were to be made. They have a lot of our rare metals here, Dick. They sure have. I'd like to set up a laboratory and live here for a few years. I'd learn something about my specialty or burst. They use gold and silver where we use copper, and platinum and its alloys where we use iron and soft steel. All their weapons are made of iridium, and all of their most highly tempered tools, such as their knives, razors, and so on, are made of opaque arnac. I suppose you noticed the edge on your razor. How could I help it? It's hard to realize that a metal can be so hard that it requires forty years on a diamond dust abrasive machine to hone a razor, or that once honed it shaves generation after generation of men without losing in any degree its keenness. I can't understand it either. I only know that it's so. 
They have all our heavy metals in great abundance and a lot more that we don't know anything about on Earth, but they apparently haven't any light metals at all. It must be that Osnome was thrown off the parent sun late, so that the light metals were all gone. Something like that, possibly. The extraordinary skill of the Kofidex made the manufacture of the instruments a short task, and after Crane had replaced the few broken instruments of the Skylark from their reserve stock, they turned their attention to the supply of copper that had been gathered. They found it enough for only two bars. "'Is this all we have?' asked Dunark sharply. "'It is, Your Highness,' replied the Kolonix. "'This is every scrap of metallic copper in the city. "'Oh, well, that will be enough to last until we can smelt the rest,' said Seaton. "'With one bar apiece, we're ready for anything Martinale can start. "'Let him come.' The bars were placed in the containers, and both vessels were tried out, each making a perfect performance. Upon the following Kokam, immediately after the first meal, the full party from Earth boarded the Skylark and accompanied the Kofidix to the copper smelter. Dunark himself directed the work of preparing the charges and the molds. Though he was continually being interrupted by wireless messages in code and by messengers bearing tidings too important to trust into the air. I hope you will excuse all of these delays, said Dunark, after the twentieth interruption, but... That's all right, Dunark. We know that you're a busy man. I can tell you about it, but I wouldn't want to tell many people. With the salt you gave us, I am preparing a power plant that will enable us to blow Mardanael into... He broke off as a wireless call for help sounded. All listened intently, learning that a freight plane was being pursued by a carlon a few hundred miles away. "'Now's the time for you to study one, Dunark,' Seaton exclaimed. "'Get your gang of scientists out here while we go get him and drag him in.' As Dunark sent the message, the Skylark's people hurried aboard, and Seaton drove the vessel toward the calls for help. With its great speed, it reached the monster before the plane was overtaken. Focusing the attractor upon the enormous metallic beak of the Carlon, Seaton threw on the power, and the beast halted in mid-air as it was jerked backward and upward. As it saw the puny size of the attacking Skylark, it opened its cavernous mouth in a horrible roar and rushed at full speed. Seaton, unwilling to have the repellers stripped from the vessel, turned on the current actuating them. The Carlon was hurled backward to the point of equilibrium of the two forces, where it struggled demoniacally. Seaton carried his captive back to the smelter, where finally, by judicious pushing and pulling, he succeeded in turning the monster flat upon its back and pinning it to the ground in spite of its struggles to escape. Soon the scientists arrived and studied the animal thoroughly, at as close a range as its flailing arms permitted. "'I wish we could kill him without blowing him to bits,' wireless Dunark. "'Do you know any way of doing it?' "'We could if we had a few barrels of ether, or some of our own poison gases, but they are all unknown here, and it would take too long to build the apparatus to make them. I'll see if I can't tire him out, and get him that way as soon as you've studied him enough.' We may be able to find out where he lives, too. The scientists, having finished their observations, Seaton jerked the animal a few miles into the air and shut off the forces acting upon it. There was a sudden crash, and the Carlon, knowing that this apparently insignificant vessel was its master, turned in headlong flight. "'Have you any idea what caused that noise just then, Dick?' asked Crane who, with characteristic imperturbability, had taken out his notebook and was making exact notes of all that transpired. "'I imagine we cracked a few of his plates,' replied Seaton with a laugh, as he held the Skylark in place a few hundred feet above the fleeing animal. Pitted for the first time in its life against an antagonist who could both outfly and outfight it, the Carlon redoubled its effort and fled in a panic of fear. 
It flew back over the city of Condillac, over the outlying country, and out over the ocean, still followed easily by the Skylark. As they neared the Mardalanian border, a fleet of warships rose to contest the entry of the monster. Seaton, not wishing to let the foe see the rejuvenated Skylark, jerked his captive high into the thin air. As soon as it was released, it headed for the ocean in an almost perpendicular dive, while Seaton focused an object compass upon it. "'Go to it, old top,' he addressed the plunging monster. "'We'll follow you clear to the bottom of the ocean, if you go that far.' There was a mighty double splash as the carlon struck the water, closely followed by the skylark. The girls gasped as the vessel plunged below the surface at such terrific speed, and seemed surprised that it had suffered no injury and that they had felt no jar. Seaton turned on the powerful searchlights and kept close enough so that he could see the monster through the transparent walls. Deeper and deeper the quarry dove, until it was plainly evident to the pursuers that it was just as much at home in the water as it was in the air. The beams of light revealed strange forms of life, among which were huge, staring-eyed fishes which floundered about blindly in the unaccustomed glare. As the carillon bored still deeper, the living things became scarcer, but still occasional fleeting glimpses were obtained of the living nightmares which inhabited the oppressive depths of these strange seas. Continuing downward, the carillon plumbed the nethermost pit of the ocean and came to rest upon the bottom, stirring up a murk of ooze. How deep are we, Mart? About four miles. I have read the pressure, but we will have to calculate later exactly what depth it represents from the gravity and density readings. As the animal showed no signs of leaving its retreat, Seaton pulled it out with the attractor and it broke for the surface. Rising through the water at full speed, it burst into the air and soared upward to such an incredible height that Seaton was amazed. I wouldn't have believed that anything could fly in air this thin, he exclaimed. It is thin up here, assented Crane, less than three pounds to the square inch. I wonder how he does it. It doesn't look as though we are ever going to find out. He's sure a bear cat, replied Seaton, as the carlon, unable to ascend further, dropped in a slanting dive toward the lowlands of Condal, the terrible swampy region covered with poisonous vegetation and inhabited by frightful animals and even more frightful savages. The monster neared the ground with ever-increasing speed. Seaton, keeping close behind it, remarked to Crane, "'He'll have to flatten out pretty quick, or he'll burst something, sure.' But it did not flatten out. It struck the soft ground head foremost and disappeared, its tentacles apparently boring away ahead of it. Astonished at such an unlooked-for development, Seaton brought the Skylark to a stop and stabbed into the ground with the attractor. The first attempt brought up nothing but a pillar of muck. The second brought to light a couple of wings and one writhing arm. The third brought the whole animal still struggling as strongly as it had in the first contest. Seaton again lifted the animal high into the air. "'If he does that again, we'll follow him.' "'Will the ship stand it?' asked Duquesne, with interest. "'Yes. The old bus wouldn't have. But this one can stand anything. We can go anywhere that thing can go. That's a cinch. If we have enough power on, we probably won't even feel a jolt when we strike ground.' Seaton reduced the force acting upon the animal, until just enough was left to keep the attractor upon it, and it again dived into the swamp. The skylark followed, feeling its way in the total darkness, until the animal stopped, refusing to move in any direction, at a depth estimated by Crane to be about three-quarters of a mile. After waiting some time, Seaton increased the power of the attractor and tore the carlon back to the surface and into the air where it turned on the Skylark with redoubled fury. 
We've dug him out of his last refuge, and he's fighting like a cornered rat, said Seaton, as he repelled the monster to a safe distance. He's apparently as fresh as when he started, in spite of all this playing. Talk about a game, Fish. He doesn't intend to run any more, though, so I guess we'll have to put him away. It's a shame to bump him off, but it's got to be done. Crane aimed one of the heavy explosive bullets at the savagely struggling monster, and the earth rocked with a concussion as the shell struck its mark. They hurried back to the smelter, where Dunark asked eagerly, "'What did you find out about it?' "'Nothing much,' replied Seaton, and in a few words described the actions of the Carlon. "'What did your savants think of it?' "'Very little that any of us can understand in terms of any other known organism. It seems to combine all the characteristics of bird, beast, and fish, and to have within itself the possibilities of both bisexual and asexual reproduction. I wouldn't doubt it. It's a queer one, all right. The copper bars were cool enough to handle, and the Skylark was loaded with five times its original supply of copper. The other vessel taking on a much smaller amount. After the Kofedix had directed the officer in charge to place the remaining bars in easily accessible places throughout the nation, the two vessels were piloted back to the palace, arriving just in time for the last meal of the Kokam. "'Well, Donark said Seaton, "'after the meal was over, "'I'm afraid that we must go back as soon as we can. "'Dorothy's parents and Martin's bankers will think they are dead by this time. We should start back right now, but... Oh, no, you must not do that. That would rob our people of the chance of bidding you goodbye. There's another reason, too. I have a mighty big favor to ask of you. It is granted. If a man can do it, consider it done. Well, you know, platinum is a very scarce and highly useful metal with us. I wonder if you could let us have a few tons of it. And I would like to have another Phaedon, too. I want to see if I can analyze it. You have given us a thousand times the value of all the platinum and all the jewels your vessel can carry. As soon as the foundries are open tomorrow, we will go and load up your storerooms, or, if you wish, we will do it now. That isn't necessary. We may as well enjoy your hospitality for one more sleeping period. Get the platinum during the first work period and bid you goodbye just before the second meal. How would that be? Perfectly satisfactory. The following Kokon, Dunark piloted the Skylark with Seaton, Crane, and Duquesne as crew to one of the great platinum foundries. The girls remained behind to get ready for their departure and for the great ceremony which was to precede it. The trip to the foundry was a short one, and the three scientists of Earth stared at what they saw, thousands of tons of platinum cast in the bars and piled up like pig iron, waiting to be made into numerous articles of everyday use throughout the nation. Dunark wrote out an order, which his chief attendant handed to the officer in charge of the foundry, saying, Please have it loaded at once. Seaton indicated the storage compartment into which the metal was to be carried, and a procession of slaves, two men staggering under one ingot, was soon formed between the pile and the storage room. "'How much are you loading on, Dunark?' asked Seaton, when the large compartment was more than half full. "'My order called for about twenty tons in your weight, but I changed it later. We may as well fill that room full, so that the metal will not rattle around in flight.' It doesn't make any difference to us. We have so much of it. It's like your gift of salt, only vastly smaller. What are you going to do with it all, Dick? asked Crane. That is enough to break the platinum market completely. That's exactly what I'm going to do, returned Seaton, with a gleam in his gray eyes. I'm going to burst this unjustifiable fad for platinum jewelry so wide open that it'll never recover and make platinum again available for its proper use in laboratories and in industries. You know yourself, he rushed on hotly, 
that the only reason platinum is used at all for jewelry is that it is expensive. It isn't nearly so handsome as either gold or silver, and if it wasn't the most costly common metal we have, the jewelry-wearing crowd wouldn't touch it with a ten-foot pole. Useless as an ornament, it is the one absolutely indispensable laboratory metal, and literally hundreds of laboratories that need it can't have it because over half the world's supply is tied up in jewelers' windows and in useless baubles. Then, too, it is the best thing known for contact points in electrical machinery. When the government and all those scientific societies were abjectly begging the jewelers to let loose a little of it, they refused. They were selling it to profiteering spendthrifts at $150 an ounce. The condition isn't much better right now. It's a vicious circle. As long as the price stays high, it will be used for jewelry. As long as it is used for jewelry, the price will stay high, and scientists will have to fight the jewelers for what little they get. While somewhat exaggerated, that is about the way matters stand. I will admit that I, too, am rather bitter on the subject, said Crane. Bitter? Of course you're bitter. Everybody is, who knows anything about science, and who has a brain in his head. Anybody who claims to be a scientist, and yet stands for any of his folks buying platinum jewelry, ought to be shot. But they'll get theirs as soon as we get back. They wouldn't let go of it before. They had too good a thing. But they'll let go now, and get their fingers burned besides. I'm going to dump this whole shipment at fifty cents a pound and will take mighty good care that jewelers don't corner the supply. I'm with you, Dick, as usual. Soon the storage room was filled to the ceiling with closely stacked ingots of the precious metal, and the Skylark was driven back to the landing dock. She alighted besides Dunark's vessel, the Condal, whose gorgeously decorated crew of high officers sprang to attention as the four men stepped out. All were dressed for the ceremonial leave-taking, the three Americans wearing their spotless white, the Condolans wearing their most resplendent trappings. "'This formal stuff sure does pull my cork,' exclaimed Seaton to Dunark. "'I want to get this straight. The arrangements was that we were to be here at this time, all dressed up, and wait for the ladies, who are coming under the escort of your people.' Yes. Our family is to escort the ladies from the palace here. As they leave the elevator, the surrounding war vessels will salute, and after a brief ceremony, you two will escort your wives into the Skylark, Dr. Duquesne standing a little apart and following you in. The war vessels will escort you as high as they can go, and the Condal will accompany you as far as our most distant sun before turning back. For a few moments, Seaton nervously paced a short beat in front of the door of the space car. "'I am getting more fussed every second, he said abruptly, taking out his wireless instrument. "'I'm going to see if they aren't about ready.' "'What seems to be the trouble, Dick? Have you another hunch, or are you just rattled?' asked Crane. "'Rattled, I guess. But I sure do want to get going,' he replied, as he worked the lever rapidly." Dotty, he sent out, and the call being answered. How long will you be? We're already waiting and chewing our fingernails with impatience. We'll soon be ready. The Carfedix is coming for us now. Scarcely had the tiny sounder become silent when the air was shaken by an urgently vibrated message, and every wireless sounder gave warning. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of the Skylark of Space by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Invasion. The pulsating air and the chattering sounders were giving the same dire warning, the alarm extraordinary of invasion, of imminent and catastrophic danger from the air. Don't try to reach the palace. Everyone on the ground will have time to hide in the deep, 
arnak-protected pits beneath the buildings, and you would be killed by the invaders long before you could reach the palace. If we can repel the enemy and keep them from landing, the women will be perfectly safe, even though the whole city is destroyed. If they effect a landing, we are lost. They will not land, then, Satan answered grimly, as he sprang into the Skylark and took his place at the boards. As Crane took out his wireless, Seaton cautioned him. Send in English, and tell the girls not to answer, as these devils can locate the calls within a foot and will be able to attack the right spot. Just tell them we're safe in the Skylark. Tell them to sit tight while we wipe out this gang that is coming, and that we'll call them once in a while, when we have time during the battle. Before Crane had finished sending the message, the crescendo whine of enormous propellers was heard. Simultaneously, there was a deafening concussion, and one entire wing of the palace disappeared in a cloud of dust, in the midst of which could be discerned a few flying fragments. The air was filled with Mardolian warships. They were huge vessels, each mounting hundreds of guns, and the rain of high-explosive shells was rapidly reducing the great city to a widespread heap of debris. Seaton's hand was upon the lever, which would hurl the Skylark upward into the fray. Crane and Duquesne, each hard of eye and grim of jaw, were stationed at their machine guns. "'Something's up!' exclaimed Seaton. "'Look at the Condal. Something had happened indeed. Dunark sat at the board, his hand upon the power lever, and each of his crew was in place, grasping his weapon, but every man was writhing in agony, unable to control his movements. As they stared, momentarily spellbound, the entire crew ceased their agonizing struggles and hung apparently lifeless from their supports. "'They've got to him some way. Let's go,' yelled Seaton. As his hand tightened upon the lever, a succession of shells burst upon the dock, wrecking it completely. All three men fancied that the world had come to an end, as the stream of high explosive was directed against their vessel. But the four-foot shell of Arnak was impregnable, and Seaton shot the Skylark upward into the midst of the enemy fleet. The two gunners fired as fast as they could sight their weapons, and with each shot one of the great warships was blown into fragments. The Mardolians then concentrated the fire of their entire fleet upon their tiny opponent. From every point of the compass, from above and below, the enemy gunners directed streams of shells against the dodging vessel. The noise was more than deafening. It was one continuous, shattering explosion, and the earthmen were surrounded by such a blaze of fire from the exploding shells that they could not see the enemy vessels. Seaton sought to dodge the shells by a long dive toward one side, only to find that dozens of new opponents had been launched against them, the deadly airplane torpedoes of Ostnome. Steered by wireless and carrying no crews, they were simply winged bombs carrying thousands of pounds of terrific electrical explosive, enough to kill the men inside the vessel by concussion of the explosion, even should the Arnak armor be strong enough to withstand the blow. Though much faster than the Osnomian vessels, they were slow beside the Skylark, and Seaton could have dodged a few of them with ease. As he dodged, however, they followed relentlessly, and in spite of those which were blown up by the gunners, their number constantly increased until Seaton thought of the repellers. "'Nobody home is right,' he exclaimed, as he threw on the power, actuating the copper bands which encircled the hull in all directions. Instantly the torpedoes were hurled backward, exploding as the force struck them, and even the shells were ineffective, exploding harmlessly as they encountered the zone of force. The noise of the awful detonations lessened markedly. "'Why the silence, I wonder,' asked Seaton, while the futile shells from the enemy continued to waste their force some hundreds of feet distant from their goal, and while Crane and Duquesne were methodically destroying the huge vessels as fast as they could aim and fire. 
at every report, one of the monster warships disappeared, its shattered fragments and the bodies of its crew hurtling to the ground. His voice could not be heard in even the lessened tumult, but he continued. It must be that our repellers have set up a partial vacuum by repelling even the air. Suddenly the shelling ceased, and the Skylark was enveloped by a blinding glare from hundreds of great reflectors, an intense, searching, bluish-violet light that burned the flesh and seared through eyelids and eyeballs into the very brain. Ultraviolet yelled Seaton at the first glimpse of the light as he threw on the power. Shut your eyes, turn your heads down. Out in space, far beyond the reach of the deadly rays, the men held a short conference, then donned heavy leather and canvas suits, which they smeared liberally with thick red paint, and replaced the plain glasses of their helmets with heavy lenses of deep ruby glass. This'll stop any ultraviolet ray ever produced, exalted Seaton, as he again threw the vessel into the Mardolian fleet. A score of great vessels met their fate before the Skylark was located, and although the terrible rays were again focused upon the intruder in all their intensity, the carnage continued. In a few moments, however, the men heard, or rather felt, a low, intense vibration, like a silent wave of sound, a vibration which smote upon the eardrums as no possible sound could smite, a vibration which racked the joints and tortured the nerves as though the whole body were disintegrating. So sudden and terrible was the effect that Seaton uttered an involuntary yelp of surprise and pain as he once more fled into the safety of space. "'What the devil was that?' demanded Duquesne. "'Was it infrasound? I didn't suppose such waves could be produced.' "'Infrasound is right. They produce almost anything here,' replied Seaton and Crane added. Well, about three fur suits apiece, with cotton in our ears. Ought to kill any wave propagated through air. The fur suits were donned forthwith, Seaton whispering in Crane's ear. I found out something else, too. The repellers repel even the air. I'm going to shoot enough juice through them to set up a perfect vacuum outside. That'll kill those air waves. Scarcely were they back within the range of the fleet when Duquesne, reaching for his gun to fire the first shot, leaped backwards with a yell. Beat it! Once more at a safe distance, Duquesne explained. It's lucky I'm so used to handling hot stuff that, from force of habit, I never make close contact with anything at the first touch. That gun carried thousands of volts with a lot of amperage behind them and if I had had a good hold on it, I couldn't have let go. We'll block that game quickly enough, though. Thick, dry gloves covered with rubber are all that is necessary. It's a good thing for all of us that you have those fancy condensite handles on your levers, Seaton. That was how they got Dunark, undoubtedly, said Crane, as he sent a brief message to the girls, assuring them that all was well as he had been doing at every respite. But why were we not overcome at the same time? They must have had the current tuned to iridium, and had to experiment until they found the right wave for steel, Seaton explained. I should think our bar would have exploded with all that current. They must have hit the copper range, too. Seaton frowned in thought before he answered. Maybe because it's induced current, and not a steady battery impulse. Anyway, it didn't. Let's go. Just a minute, put in Crane. What are they going to do next, Dick? Search me. I'm not used to my new Osnomian mine yet. I recognize things all right after they happen, but I can't seem to figure ahead. It's like a dimly remembered something that flashes up as soon as mentioned. I get too many and too new ideas at once. I know, though, that the Osnomians have defenses against all these things except this last stunt of the charged guns. That must be the new one that Mardinale stole from Condal. The defenses are, however, 
purely Osnomian in character and material. As we haven't got the stuff to set them up as the Osnomians do, we'll have to do it our own way. We may be able to dope out the next one, though. Let's see what they have given us so far. We've got to hand it to them, responded Duquesne admiringly. They've given us the whole range of wavelengths one at a time. They've given us light, both ultraviolet and visible. Sound, infrasound, and electricity. I don't know what's left, unless they give us a new kind of X-rays, or Hertzian, or infrared heat waves, or... That's it, heat, exclaimed Seaton. They produce heat by means of powerful wave generators, and by setting up heavy induced currents in the armor, they can melt arnak that way. Do you suppose we can handle the heat with our refrigerators? asked Crane. Probably. We have a lot of power, and the new arnak cylinders of our compressors will stand anything. The only trouble will be in cooling the condensers. We'll run as long as we have any water in our tanks, then go dive into the ocean to cool off. We'll try it a whirl, anyway. Soon the Skylark again was dealing out death and destruction in the thick of the enemy vessels, who again turned from the devastation of the helpless city to destroy this troublesome antagonist. But in spite of the utmost efforts of light waves, sound waves, and high-tension electricity, the space car continued to take its terrible toll. As Seaton had foretold, the armor of the Skylark began to grow hot, and he turned on the full power of the refrigerating system. In spite of the cooling apparatus, however, the outer walls finally began to glow redly, and although the interior was comfortably cool, the ends of the rifle barrels, which were set flush with the surface of the revolving Arnock globes which held them, softened, rendering the guns useless. The copper repellers melted and dripped off in flaming balls of molten metal, so that shells once more began to crash against the armor. Duquesne, with no thought of quitting apparent in his voice or manner, said calmly, Well, it looks as though they had us stopped for a few minutes. Let's go back into space and dope out something else. Seaton, thinking intensely, saw a vast fleet of enemy reinforcements approaching, and at the same time received the wireless call directed to Dunark. It was from the Grand Fleet of Condal, hastening from the bordering ocean to the defense of the city. Using Dunark's private code, Seaton told the Carbix, who was in charge of the fleet, that the enemy had a new invention which would wipe them out utterly without a chance to fight, and that he and his vessel were in control of the situation, and ordered him to see that no Condalian ship came within battle range of a Mardalayan. He then turned to Crane and Duquesne, his face grim and his fighting jaw set. I've got it doped right now. Give the Lark speed enough and she's some bullet herself. We've got four feet of Arnak. They've got only an inch, and Arnak doesn't even begin to soften until far above a blinding white temperature. Strap yourselves in solid. It's going to be a rough party from now on. They buckled their belts firmly, and Seaton, holding the bar toward their nearest antagonist, applied twenty notches of power. The Skylark darted forward and crashed completely through the great airship. Torn wide open by the forty-foot projectile, its engines wrecked and its helicopter screws and propellers completely disabled, the helpless hulk plunged through two miles of empty air, a mass of wreckage. Darting hither and thither, the space car tore through vessel after vessel of the Mardolian fleet. She was an embodied thunderbolt, a huge, irresistible, indestructible projectile, directed by a keen brain inside it, the brain of Richard Seaton, roused to his highest fighting pitch and fighting for everything that man holds dear. Tortured by the terrible silent waves, which now that the protecting vacuum had been destroyed, were only partially stopped by the fur suits, shaken and battered by the terrific impacts and the even greater shocks occurring every second as the direction of the vessel was changed, 
made sick and dizzy by the nauseating swings and lurches as the Skylark spun about the central chamber, Seaton's wonderful physique and his nerves of steel stood him in good stead in this, the supreme battle of his life, as with teeth tight-locked and eyes gray and hard as the fracture of high-carbon steel, he urged the Skylark on to greater and greater efforts. Though it was impossible for the eye to follow the flight of the space car, the mechanical sighting devices of the Mardolian vessels kept her in as perfect focus as though she were stationary, and the great generators continued to hurl into her the full power of their death-dealing waves. The enemy guns were still spitting forth their streams of high-explosive shells, but unlike the waves, the shells moved so slowly compared to their target that only a few found their mark, and many of the vessels fell to the ground, riddled by the shells of their sister ships. With anxious eyes, Seaton watched the hull of his animated cannonball change in color. From dull red, it became cherry, and as the cherry red gave place to bright red heat, Seaton threw even more power into the bar, as he muttered through his set teeth. Well, Seaton, old top, you've got to cut out this loafing on the job and get busy. In spite of his utmost exertions and in spite of the powerful ammonia plant now exerting its full capacity, but sadly handicapped by the fact that its cooling water was now boiling, Seaton saw the Arnak shell continue to heat. The bright red was succeeded by orange, which slowly changed, first to yellow, then to light yellow, and finally to a dazzling white, through which, with the aid of his heavy red lenses, he could still see the enemy ships. After a time, he noted that the color had gone down to yellow, and he thrilled with exultation, knowing that he had so reduced the number of the enemy fleet that their wave generators could no longer overcome his refrigerators. After a few minutes more of the awful carnage, there remained only a small fraction of the proud fleet which, thousands strong, had invaded Condal, a remnant that sought safety in flight. But even in flight they still fought with all their weapons, and the streams of bombs dropped from their keel batteries upon the country beneath marked the path of their retreat with a wide swath of destruction. Half inclined to let the few remaining vessels escape, Seaton's mind changed instantly as he saw the bombs spreading devastation upon the countryside and not until the last of the Mardolian vessels had been destroyed did he drop the Skylark into the area of ruins which had once been the palace grounds, beside the Condal, which was still lying as it had fallen. After several attempts to steady their whirling senses, the three men finally were able to walk, and opening a door, they leaped out through the opening in the still glowing wall. Seaton's first act was to wireless the news to Dorothy, who replied that they were coming as fast as they could. The men then removed their helmets, revealing faces pale and drawn, and turned to the helpless space car. There's no way of getting into this thing from the outside, Seaton began, when he saw that the Kofedix and his party were beginning to revive. Soon Dunark opened the door and stumbled out. I have to thank you for more than my life this time, he said, his voice shaken by uncontrollable emotion as he grasped the hands of all three men. Though unable to move, I was conscious and saw all that happened. You kept them so busy that they didn't have a chance to give us enough to kill us outright. You saved the lives of millions of our nation and have saved Condal itself from annihilation. Oh, it's not that bad, answered Seaton uncomfortably. Both nations have been invaded before. Yes, once when we developed the ultraviolet ray, once when Mardanel perfected the machine for producing the silent sound wave, and again when we harnessed the heat wave. But this would have been the most complete disaster in history. The other inventions were not so deadly as was this one, and there were terrible battles from which the victors emerged so crippled that they could not completely exterminate the vanquished, who were able to re-establish themselves in the course of time. If it had not been for you, this would have been the end, as not a Condolinian soldier could move, 
Any person touching iridium was helpless and would have been killed. He ceased speaking and saluted as the Carfedex and his party rounded a heap of boulders. Dorothy and Margaret screamed in unison as they saw the haggard faces of their husbands and saw their suits dripping with a thick substance which they knew to be red in spite of its purplish-black color. Seaton dodged nimbly as Dorothy sought to take him in her arms and tore off his suit. "'Nothing but red paint to stop their light rays,' he reassured her, as he lifted her clear off the ground in a soul-satisfying embrace. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the Condoleans staring in open-mouthed amazement at the Skylark. Wheeling swiftly, he laughed as he saw a gigantic ball of frost and snow. Again donning his first suit, he shut off the refrigerators and returned to his party, where the Carfedix gave him thanks in measured terms. As he fell silent, Dunark added, Thanks to you, the Mardolian forces, instead of wiping us out, are themselves destroyed, while only a handful of our vessels have been lost. Since the Grand Fleet could not arrive until the battle was over, and since the vessels that would have thrown themselves away were saved by your orders, which I heard, thanks to you, we are not even crippled. Though our capital is destroyed and the lives of some unfortunates who could not reach the pits in time have probably been lost. Thanks to you, he continued in a ringing voice, and to the salt and the new source of power you have given us, Mardanael shall now be destroyed utterly. After sending out ships to relieve the suffering of the few wounded and the many homeless, Dunark summoned a corps of mechanics who banded on new repellers and repaired the fused barrels of the machine guns, all that was necessary to restore the Skylark to perfect condition. Facing the party from Earth, the Carfedix stood in the ruins of his magnificent palace. Back of him were the nobles of Condal, and still further back, in order of rank, stood a multitude of people. Is it permitted, O noble Carfedo, that I reward your captive for his share in the victory, he asked. It is, acquiesced Seton and Crane, and Roban stepped up to Duquesne and placed in his hand a weighty leather bag. He then fastened about his left wrist the Order of Condal, the highest order of the nation. He then clasped about Crane's wrist a heavily jeweled, peculiarly ornamented disc, wrought of deep ruby-red metal supported by a heavy bracelet of the same material, the most precious metal of Osnome. At sight of the disc, the nobles saluted, and Seaton barely concealed a start of surprise, for it bore the royal emblem, and delegated to its bearer power second only to that of the Carfedex himself. "'I bestow upon you this symbol, Carfedex Crane, in recognition of what you have done this day for Condal." wherever you may be upon Condolian Osnome, which from this day henceforth shall be all Osnome, you have power as my personal representative, as my eldest son. He drew forth a second bracelet, similar to the first, except that it bore seven discs, each differently designed, which he snapped upon Seton's wrist as the nobles knelt and the people back of them threw themselves upon their faces. No language spoken by man possesses words sufficiently weighty to express our indebtedness to you, Carfedix Seton, our guest and our savior. The first cause has willed that you should be the instrument through which Condal is this day made supreme upon Osnome. In small and partial recognition of that instrumentality, I bestow upon you these symbols, which proclaim you our overlord, the ultimate authority of Osnome. While this is not the way in which I had thought to bid you farewell, the obligations which you have heaped upon us render all smaller things insignificant. When you return, as I hope and trust you soon will, the city shall be built anew, and we can welcome you as befits your station. Lifting both arms above his head, he continued, 
May the great first cause smile upon you in all your endeavors until you solve the mystery. May your descendants soon reach the ultimate goal. Goodbye. Seaton uttered a few heartfelt words in response, and the party stepped backward toward the Skylark. As they reached the vessel, the standing Carfidix and the ranks of kneeling nobles snapped into the double salute, truly a rare demonstration in Condal. "'What do we do now?' whispered Seaton. "'Bow, of course,' answered Dorothy. They bowed deeply and slowly and entered their vessel. As the Skylark shot into the air with the greatest acceleration that would permit its passengers to move about, the grand fleet of Condolian warship fired a deafening salute. It had been planned before the start that each person was to work sixteen hours out of the twenty-four. Seaton was to drive the vessel during the first two eight-hour periods of each day. Crane was to observe the stars during the second and drive during the third. Duquesne was to act as observer during the first and third periods. Margaret volunteered to assist the observer in taking his notes during her waking hours, and Dorothy appointed herself cook and household manager. As soon as the Skylark had left Osnome, Crane told Duquesne that he and his wife would work in the observation room until four o'clock in the afternoon, at which time the prearranged system of relief would begin, and Duquesne retired to his room. Crane and Margaret made their way to the darkened room, which housed the instruments and seated themselves, watching intently, making no effort to conceal their emotion, as first the persons beneath them, then the giant war vessels, and finally the ruined city itself were lost to view. Ostome slowly assumed the proportions of a large moon, grew smaller, and as it disappeared, Crane began to take notes. For a few hours, the seventeen suns of this strange solar system shone upon the flying space car, after which they assumed the aspect of a widely separated cluster of enormous stars, slowly growing smaller and smaller and shrinking closer and closer together. At four o'clock in the afternoon, Washington time, Duquesne relieved Crane, who made his way to the engine room. It's time to change shifts, Dick. You have not had your sixteen hours, but everything will be regular from now on. You too had better get some rest. All right, replied Seaton, as he relinquished the controls to Crane, and after bidding the new helmsman good night, he and Dorothy went below to their cabin. Standing at the window, with their arms around each other, they stared down with misty eyes at the very faint green star, which was rapidly decreasing in brilliance as the Skylark increased its already inconceivable velocity. Finally, as it disappeared altogether, Seaton turned to his wife and tenderly, lovingly, took her in his arms. Little girl, sweetheart, he whispered, and paused, overcome by the intensity of his feelings. I know, husband mine, she answered, while tears dimmed her glorious eyes. It is too deep. With nothing but words, we can't say a single thing. End of chapter 18、Chapter、recording is in the public domain. The Return to Earth Duquesne's first act upon gaining the privacy of his own cabin was to open the leather bag presented to him. By the Carfidix. He expected to find it filled with rare metals, with perhaps some jewels, instead of which the only metal present was a heavily insulated tube containing a full pound of metallic radium. The least valuable items in the bag were scores of diamonds, rubies, and emeralds of enormous size and of flawless perfection. Merely ornamental glass upon Osnome. Dunark knew that they were priceless on earth and had acted accordingly. To this great wealth of known gems, he had added a rich and varied assortment of the rare and strange jewels peculiar to his own world the Phaedon, 
alone being omitted from the collection. Duquesne's habitual calmness of mind almost deserted him as he classified the contents of the bag. The radium alone was worth millions of dollars, and the scientist in him exalted that at last his brother scientists should have ample supplies of that priceless metal with which to work, even while he was rejoicing in the price he would exact for it. He took out the familiar jewels, estimating their value as he counted them, a staggering total. The bag was still half full of the strange gems, some of them glowing like miniature lamps in the dark depths, and he made no effort to appraise them. He knew that once any competent jeweler had compared their cold, hard, scintillating beauty with that of any earthly gems he could demand his own price. At last, he breathed to himself, I will be what I have always longed to be, a money power. Now I can cut loose from that gang of crooks and go my own way. He replaced the gems and the tube of radium in the bag, which he stowed away in one of his capacious pockets, and made his way to the galley. The return voyage through space was uneventful the Skylark constantly maintaining the same velocity with which she had started out. Several times as the days wore on, she came within the zone of attraction of various gigantic suns. But the pilot had learned his lesson. He kept a vigilant eye upon the bar, and at the first sign of a deviation from the perpendicular, he steered away, far from the source of that attraction. Not content with these precautions, the man at the board would, from time to time, shut off the power to make sure that the space car was not falling toward a body directly in its line of flight. When half the distance had been covered, the bar was reversed, the travelers holding an impromptu ceremony as the great vessel spun around its center through an angle of 180 degrees. A few days later, the observers began to recognize some of the fixed stars in familiar constellations, and knew that the yellowish-white star, directly in their line of flight, was the sun of their own solar system. After a time, they saw that their course, instead of being directly toward the rapidly brightening star, was bearing upon a barely visible star, a little to one side of it. Pointing their most powerful telescope toward that point of light, Crane made out a planet, half of its disk shining brightly. The girls hastened to peer through the telescope, and they grew excited as they made out the familiar outlines of the continents and oceans upon the lighted portion of the disk. It was not long until these outlines were plainly visible to the unaided vision. The Earth appeared as a great, softly shining greenish half-moon, with parts of its surface obscured by fleecy wisps of clouds, and with its two gleaming ice caps making of its poles two brilliant areas of white. The returning wanderers stared at their own world with their hearts in their throats as Crane, who was at the board, increased the retarding force sufficiently to assure himself that they would not be traveling too fast to land upon the earth. After Dorothy and Margaret had gone to prepare a meal, Duquesne turned to Seaton. "'Have you gentlemen decided what you intend to do with me?' "'No, we haven't discussed it yet. I can't make up my own mind what I want to do to you, except that I was sure would like to get you inside a square ring with four-ounce gloves on. You have been of too much real assistance on this trip for us to see you hanged as you deserve. On the other hand, you are altogether too much of a thoroughgoing scoundrel for us to let you go free. You see the fix we are in. What would you suggest? Nothing, replied Duquesne calmly. As I am in no danger whatever of hanging, nothing you can say on that score affects me in the least. As for freeing me, you may do as you please. It makes no difference to me, one way or the other. No jail can hold me for a day. I can say, however, that while I have made a fortune on this trip, so that I do not have to associate further with steel, unless it is in my interest to do so, I may nevertheless 
find it desirable at some future time to establish a monopoly of X. That would, of course, necessitate the death of yourself and Crane. In that event, or in case any other difference should arise between us, this whole affair will be as though it had never existed. It will have no weight either way, whether or not you try to hang me. Go as far as you like, Seaton answered cheerfully. If we're not a match for you and your gang, on foot or in the air, in body or in mind, we'll deserve whatever we get. We can outrun you, outjump you, throw you down or lick you. We can run faster, hit harder, dive deeper and come up drier than you can. We'll play any game you want to deal, whenever you want to deal it, for fun, money, chalk, or marbles. His brow darkened in anger as a thought struck him, and the steady gray eyes bored into the unflinching black ones as he continued, with no trace of his former levity in his voice. But listen to this. Anything goes as far as Martin and I personally are concerned. But I want you to know that I could be arrested for what I think of you as a man, and if any of your little schemes touch Dottie or Peggy in any way, shape, or form, I'll kill you as I would a snake, or rather, I'll take you apart as I would any other piece of scientific apparatus. That isn't a threat. It's a promise. Get me? Perfectly. Good night. For many hours the earth had been obscured by clouds, so that the pilot had only a general idea of what part of the world was beneath them. But as they dropped rapidly downward into the twilight zone, the clouds parted and they saw that they were directly over the Panama Canal. Seaton allowed the Skylark to fall to within ten miles of the ground, when he stopped so that Martin could get his bearings and calculate the course to Washington, which would be in total darkness before their arrival. Duquesne had retired, cold and recitant as usual. Glancing quickly about his cabin to make sure that he had overlooked nothing he could take with him, he opened a locker, exposing to view four suits which he had made in his spare time, each adapted to a particular method of escape from the Skylark. The one he selected was of heavy canvas, braced with steel netting, equipped with helmet and air tanks, and attached to a strong, heavy parachute. He put it on, tested all its parts, and made his way unobserved to one of the doors in the lower part of the vessel. Thus, when the chance to escape came, he was ready for it. As the Skylark paused over the isthmus, his lips parted in a sardonic smile. He opened the door and stepped out into the air, closing the door behind him as he fell. The neutral color of his parachute was lost in the gathering twilight a few seconds after he left the vessel. The course laid, Seaton turned almost due north, and the Skylark tore through the air. After a short time, when half the ground had been covered, Seaton spoke suddenly. Forgot about Duquesne, Mart. We'd better iron him, hadn't we? Then we'll decide whether we want to keep him or turn him loose. I will go fetch him, replied Crane, and turned to the stairs. He returned shortly with the news of the flight of the captive. Hmm, he must have made himself a parachute. I didn't think even he would tackle a 60,000-foot drop. I'll tell the world that he sure has established a record. I can't say I'm sorry that he got away, though. We can get him any time we want him anyway, as that little object compass in my drawer is still looking right at him, said Seaton. I think he earned his liberty, declared Dorothy stoutly, and Margaret added, He deserves to be shot, but I'm glad he's gone. He gives me the shivers. At the end of the calculated time, they saw the lights of a large city beneath them, and Crane's fingers clenched upon Seaton's arm as he pointed downward. There were the landing lights of Crane Field, seven peculiarly arranged searchlights throwing their mighty beams upward into the night. Nine weeks, Dick, he said unsteadily, and Shiro would have kept them burning nine years if necessary. The Skylark dropped easily to the ground in front of the testing shed, 
and the wanderers leaped out to be greeted by the half-hysterical Jap. Shiro's ready vocabulary of peculiar but sonorous words failed him completely, and he bent himself double in a bow, his yellow face wreathed in the widest possible smile. Crane, one arm around his wife, seized Shiro's hand and wrung it in silence. Seaton swept Dorothy off her feet, pressing her slender form against his powerful body. Her arms tightened about his neck as they kissed each other fervently, and he whispered into her ear, "'Sweetheart, wife, isn't it great to be back on our good old earth again?' End of chapter 19 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas End of The Skylark of Space by E. E. Doc Smith